I'm Diana Brown, the Technology Director for the Puget Sound Educational Service District, and I'm here to talk to you about something that IT directors never talk about. What happened when our network was successfully victimized by a ransomware attack? I'll walk you through what happened in the tech spaces and data centers, but that's not the entire story. Arguably, nothing is more jolting to a business than the inability to access its information and digital systems and platforms to conduct business. That scenario occurred at our organization during the summer of 2020. Our business continuity was threatened and as DICE boss, the event afforded me the unique opportunity to observe and participate firsthand in managing this cyber event. I'm Claremont Capel, uh, the executive director at the Puget Sound Educational Services District, where one of my responsibilities as DICE supervisor is providing executive support and leadership for our inward facing technology functions. So often when these attacks occur, organizations are reluctant to speak about it. As if the organization as the victim is muzzled into secrecy. So our purpose here today is to remove that veil so that others can learn from our experience. Puget Sound Educational Service District is one of nine such districts or ESDs in the state of Washington. ESDs provide regional support to school districts and charter schools. We deliver a diverse array of educational and operational services within the Puget Sound region. Our ESD specifically serves the two most populous counties in Washington, encompassing the state's two largest cities and the central metropolitan area, home to over two thirds of the state's K-12 student population. In my role, I also manage two risk pools. I've been working in risk management in some form for a couple of decades now. So I consider myself a savvy business person with extensive understanding of the risk landscape. However, the experience that we went through last summer uh, totally blew me away. And I've come to uh, realize that you really don't understand uh, what you don't know until you've lived through it. I was amazed at the money, organization, sophistication, and professional coordination behind these attacks, and equally impressed by the capabilities of our response teams. In the process, I learned how much a secure working environment, as well as how we protect ourselves from these attacks, rests in the hands of our employees. In our cybersecurity staff training that Dai conducted, she talked about the difference between HIPAA secure, which is more about the configuration of our systems, and HIPAA compliant, which is more about how staff uses those systems. During these events, I learned that this applies to all of our security, not just uh, the security that occurs within a healthcare uh, environment. Did they tell you there was going to be a quiz? The first ransomware attack was in 1989, when a Harvard researcher sent thousands of infected floppy disks to the attendees of a World Health Organization conference on AIDS. Since that time, ransomware has constantly adapted to capitalize on conditions. In 2020's pandemic year, ransomware actors turned their attention to those with a low tolerance for downtime, such as medicine, emergency services, and schools. Earlier this year, one security company estimated that in 2021, ransomware will do over $20 billion worth of damage. This is why your network folks have gray hair. We know all these things, but most of us don't really know how a ransomware attack works. This is more or less how they're happening right now. First, they make an attempt to gain entry into your systems. That spear phishing email, or maybe those remote access tools that you put up in a hurry when we suddenly move to remote work for our pandemic. Once they're inside, it's no longer a matter of autobots triggering automatic encryption of your files. Today's ransomware is human run. They take their time to look around, decide what you have that's of interest, see what security software you're running, look at your operational patterns, decide when's a good time to light off their attack. This gives them plenty of time to get copies of any data that they think might be valuable. 
Once they're sure of their plan, then they pick a time when they know your response will be slowest and detonate their attack. Current ransomware often doesn't stop there. Double extortion, where you pay a fee to get your decryptor and another fee to keep your data from being released, is becoming extremely common. Historically, big ransomware operations have been honorable thieves. They have a good business model, and it's in their interest to come through with the goods once paid. But as activity has ramped up and secondary players have come into the market, it's also increasingly common for those same actors to come back months later and hit you up for a third fee to keep them from releasing the data that they didn't actually destroy the first time around. This experience revealed to me the sophistication of this subculture. Like any other business, there's an economic model to maximize profits. This double extortion that Dai talked about was really new to me. Not only is there the opportunity for the threat actor to monetarily gain from reuniting the organization with its information, there's also the opportunity for that threat actor to double down and exploit an organization's stewardship of sensitive information that's governed by state and federal laws. I was also amazed to find an actual help desk for these threat actors. Uh, there are developers and sellers of malware, and there are purchasers who have access to a help desk on how to deploy the malware to maximize the use. The worst year of my life began with a phone call. If you're in IT, you've gotten this phone call a hundred times. Late on a Saturday night, someone rang me up to say, this website is down. Heck, 10 or 15% of the time, the website's actually down. This was one of those times. I couldn't get to the site. I couldn't make the server answer me. My IT manager couldn't make the server answer him. So he committed to going in first thing in the morning to check it out. By the time he got there, everything was gone. There was a big black hole where all of our data used to be. We didn't know that at first, of course. He lit up the server, saw the ransom note, took a photo, texted it to me, rang my number, shut the machine down, found two more and shut them down while he waited for me to answer the phone. I gave him the only answer I could. Shut it all down, get the dirty stuff offline, get the clean stuff where it can't be infected. I'll call Claremont. I knew I needed to tell my boss, both because our leadership needed to understand that there was going to be an impact staff on Monday morning, and because I could rely on him to contact our cyber insurer and handle the business while we handled the tech. Like most incidents, we figured we'd spend Sunday taking stock, figuring out where we were at, and getting things back online so that the users could work when they arrived on Monday morning. But that wasn't how it worked out. I knew our insurance had a cyber coverage policy included and that it would pay the cost of a cyber incident. But beyond that, I can't say that I had a clear picture of what the process would look like. I called our representative and they advised us not to touch anything until we were connected with the cyber insurer's resources. As it turned out, there was a slight delay and that didn't happen until 48 hours later. I was a little surprised to find that the first resource they connected us with wasn't technical at all. It was a group of attorneys. By doing that, uh, they ensured that every conversation about our incident and recovery was covered under attorney-client privilege. The attorneys then brought in a cyber forensic team. These folks, uh, have a language of their own. But uh, thanks to Dai, she's pretty good at translating what she calls geek to English. I did walk out of it knowing a few things that I didn't know uh, going in. In a nutshell, this wasn't a random virus. We had been targeted by highly professional international criminals, and their operation was far more structured and far reaching than I could have imagined. The damage to our network was more serious than I had envisioned. You know, here and I say everything in the server room is gone. It sounded bad and it really didn't need any translation. 
Here in her catalog, half a century's worth of public data for the attorneys brought that home in a whole new way. The initial review was meticulous. Uh, no stone was unturned. Our IT team assessed the impact to business and data, including where sensitive data existed. Our team was prepared for every question and every action they had taken was just what the forensic team wanted to see. It was a proud moment, at least for me, and I'm sure for Dai, which is something odd to say, given the situation. Uh, no, I've always regarded Dai as very competent. Uh, but listening to those initial conversations with the cyber forensic team, hearing them start out talking to her the way they talked to me and gradually hearing the tenor of that conversation change, give me a different understanding of how competent and skilled our tech team is. We all think our team is like the best in the business, but listening to how quickly they gain the respect of this highly skilled uh, specialty team until they were clearly speaking as equals was, was really um, something to see. You know, we push buttons and things come on, click the mouse and resources appear. And when I heard it forensically dissected, I gained a new appreciation for the skill talent and just the number of interactive moving parts involved in making that happen. Once the, the team felt they had an understanding of what had happened, they finally began to talk about our options for moving forward. I was present for every meeting. I mean, every single meeting, two to three times a week for about an hour. And I felt that it was important uh, for me to be there in every way possible, even symbolically to support the team uh, during this challenging time. At times, I ordered lunch, uh, popping in from time to time during pandemic required building closure. So just staff seeing you there demonstrates that uh, they are supported and that leadership has their back. I won't pretend I didn't enjoy sitting by while Claremont watched the forensic team go from talking to us like customers to talking to us like peers. But really, all we wanted was to get working on our servers to get our staff back online and in business. By the end of that first phone call, we understood that was days in our future. The first thing that happened was we got the opportunity to make a whole lot of new friends. Once we called our insurers, we almost never spoke to them again because the first thing they did was connected us with a group of attorneys. Every step of this process would be protected by attorney-client privilege. The attorneys, in turn, connected us with a cyber forensic resource who would help us track the activity through our network, understand exactly what had been touched, and provide support and guidance through some of the more complicated parts of our recovery. And when it became clear that was gonna be a need, the cyber forensic folks connected us with a ransom recovery team who specialized in dealing with the threat actor who had compromised our systems. We had been in the midst of some major network renovations. One of our pending tasks was the replacement of our backup system, which wasn't fully segmented and didn't have an offline component. They got everything. Primary backup, secondary, archival, everything was gone. Our only hope was to recover our servers. The forensic team began by discussing some simple recovery possibilities that might work. But we'd had the chance to research that ransom note and we'd identified our threat actor. Their encryption was gonna be well beyond that capacity. We laid out the details of who we thought they were and why. And once the forensic team saw our analysis, they stopped talking about recovery and started talking about the ransom process. They'd connect us with a specialist who deals with that particular threat actor. That specialist would negotiate on our behalf, obtain a proof decryptor that would let us decrypt a couple of files just to show that they could indeed provide the goods. And then we'd make a payment in cryptocurrency and get a full decryptor. We were lucky. Our attacker must have thought we were a school district. Once they got a look at our data and realized we didn't have a juicy database full of student information or really anything of interest to them, they set a pretty low ransom. While we'd been careful not to touch anything, someone had clicked the link in that ransom note and started a timer ticking. The ransom had already doubled by the time our intermediary contacted them. 
they negotiated a return to the original price. Three days later, we had decryptors. We weren't idle during that time period. We spent those days gathering data and logs from our infected machines and ferrying them back to the forensic team for analysis and taking images of our infected machines, freezing them in time so that we could revisit them later if the investigation required it. We were working every waking hour, but as far as our staff could tell, nothing was happening. It was the first week of August, and they were all doing their best to prepare for the start of school with nothing more than whatever they'd happened to have on their local laptops. So I want to touch a bit on the business aspect of the ransom process, the threat actor location and international sanctions. Based on the geographic location of our threat actor, if our event had occurred a few months later, we could not legally have given them money. Payment information involved a cryptocurrency I had never heard of. Our intermediary compared it to a federal database to ensure that the cryptocurrency wasn't tagged as being involved in money laundering. This too would have made it illegal for us to pay uh, the threat actor. Uh, they also explained that once the ransom was paid, we'd most likely get a decryptor, but the threat actor could still also set up a separate price to keep them from releasing our sensitive data. That's the double ransom that I alluded to earlier. And some threat actors were beginning to return months later to demand to be paid again. So no matter what choice we made, we'd have to treat the data as compromised. You hear about these events, but it was surreal for me that I was actually involved in one. Um, trusting the expertise of our partners and asking questions when you don't understand certain elements that your partners deal with on a daily basis, uh, instill a sense of control, albeit limited, uh, over this, uh, this challenging situation, despite the the uncertainty on when we can have access to our network again and the impact to our business. And one of the most impactful uh, elements of this uh, situation is that our tech team couldn't really start their recovery efforts until our cyber forensic team had all the data they needed and recovery efforts could damage required evidence. We couldn't get our job started until the, the cyber forensic team uh, finished their work. We were advised to expect to be completely offline for about three weeks. The current average uh, our team informed us was around 19 days. With school due to start immediately after Labor Day, we could expect all of our resources to be unavailable until at least mid-August. During that time, we also uh, had been offered the opportunity to make new connections. Uh, as a state agency, we were required to report the incident to the state auditor who ran their own investigation to assess potential fiscal losses. Our grant funded programs were required to report the incident to their grant authorities. And of course, the FBI uh, spoke to our team less to help with the investigation which the forensic team was on top of than to gather information to support their own work. This slide is for the tech folks. For the rest of you, we'll try to keep it brief. At the beginning of week two, we were finally able to start our recovery. Our first step was to reconfigure our network into three separate workspaces, a dirty network to house all of our infected machines, a workspace, that we could connect to the dirty network long enough to move one machine in, then close it off again, decrypt it and clean it up, make sure it was decontaminated, and then connect to a live network and move that machine back out into service. These networks provided the space we needed to work in, but we'd need more server capacity to carry that work out. This was the first summer of the pandemic. Every computer manufacturer was months behind on fulfillment. Fortunately for us, 
a local recycler had a unit that would work for us. Recovering each server required a multi-step process that usually worked on the first try. One machine took 11 attempts. Once we had a few of them under our belt, we had the ability to estimate how much time it was going to take to get our entire data center back together. Our best case, minimum time for a simple server that recovered perfectly without any errors was about 16 labor hours. Our worst case estimate, our primary file server, if everything went right the first time, would take a minimum of 124 labor hours. You want to guess which one failed 11 times? Once that process was complete, recovery only meant that the machine was live. Encryption is hard on databases, including the one that stores your file permissions. We lost permissions and ownership to almost every file on our servers and had to reclaim ownership one layer of folders at a time in order to be able to run scripts to add permissions back. And of course, for many application servers, we didn't have scripts that had recorded the permissions on complex system directories. Most of those had to be completely rebuilt from the ground up, but they still had to be decrypted and recovered in order to get their data and configurations. We started with our domain controllers. At the beginning of week two, our staff could once again access our critical cloud systems, our phones, and email. Working seven days a week, our network team was able to restore the bulk of user-facing services in about 60 days. We dropped to six-day weeks, and two months later had most of our less visible services up and running. It was six months before everything was fully functional. During that time, our network team worked on nothing but recovery and repair. So at the end of that four months, just as we were starting to feel like we could see the light at the end of the tunnel, we will, we were dealt another blow. The forensic team found no evidence of any compromise of data from our servers. And we thought that uh, the danger was behind us. But as they work forward in their investigation, they found that the contents of several mailboxes had been accessed, and in some cases, synchronized to an iPhone. Uh, it's likely that this data was never viewed, but we had to treat it as if it had been. We spent weeks identifying the individuals associated with that information, gathering address information, and in some cases, identifying where the data came from in the first place. Along the way, we learned a few things I would never have thought of before all this began. Uh, first, our uh, incident resulted in several other organizations having to report a data breach. Information sent to our staff from some of our uh, member school districts contained protected data, but the information was not ours, it was theirs. So they were the ones with the contact information and, and they also had the relationship with the, impact, with the impacted party. And as a result, the legal obligation for notification was with them. We were able to conduct uh, the notification letters in our process, but these partners had to walk through the same data breach assessment and notification as we did. Second, we learned that the legal protections around data affected a lot more data than we realized. For example, our workers' compensation trusts commonly email loss runs, which is a, a typical report used by the insurance industry to track and analyze claim data. The accepted format for this report includes the claimant's name and injury information. Under Washington law and several dozen other states, this meets threshold for protected medical data. About three fourths of the records came from this uh, standard report. The majority of the rest came from common classroom data such as class rosters and attendance information. Third, 
we learned that even information you can't see counts. Some of the potentially compromised records came from a spreadsheet that appeared to have nothing but a couple of graphs. Examination of the formula showed that a tab of data had been hidden from view. While the graph data was general, it was based on information taken from a student information database. The data export included the students' names. They weren't needed for the graphs, just an extra field that had been ignored rather than deleted. But the presence of student names tipped the scale. Every record in the data was a FERPA breach. Most of this data uh, was years old. In many cases, staff didn't realize or remember that they had it. If our staff had been in the habit of cleaning out their old mail or had automatic deletion policies applied, we would have had zero data compromise. But that lesson was still ahead of us. So you think once we had done all the work to identify the impacted parties, arranged to send out notification letters and set up credit monitoring options for anyone whose data included the elements needed for identity theft, that the excitement would be over. In fact, it had just begun. Because we didn't have addresses for 100% of the names, we were also required to add a public notification to our website. We created the page early so, so that we could have a link to include in our notification letters and plan to launch both at the same time. But before we could get that far, a local news agency became aware of the notification page. The news coverage was brief and jolting. Uh, the reporter made it sound as if uh, every person in every one of our member districts, nearly half a million people, had their identities potentially stolen, rather than the tiny percentage of those who had mostly basic injury claim data potentially revealed. So within 24 hours of the news report, staff began to inform us that they were seeing Facebook ads soliciting them for a class action lawsuit. The next day, they began receiving those solicitation via messages on LinkedIn. That disappeared pretty quickly, though presumably once the advertiser figured out that the scope was far too small to be worth their while, but of course we couldn't know that at the time. We discovered uh, the data incident by the end of November. By Christmas week, we had quantified the scope and tracked down address information. Notification went out in early January, around 45 days start to finish. But the news reported that the initial malware incident occurred in July and the data incident was just now being publicized, opening us up to criticism and misunderstanding as viewers interpreted that to mean we had waited six months to let impacted parties know. We found some things we were really glad we'd been doing and some other things we wished we'd been doing, and a few more that we'd been doing well enough, but wanted to do better. For example, we'd been geofencing half a dozen really obvious countries. Now, everything's locked out except a couple of places we explicitly want you to be able to log in from. We added multi-factor for all users, and we've updated our authentication structure so that if our server room went offline today, our users would still have access to critical cloud resources. The techs weren't the only ones who learned some things new in this process. We've learned to think differently about things we leave lying around, like years worth of stale data in our email boxes. I've certainly gained a different understanding of viruses and malware. I used to think of them as run random things that just happen to careless people. But this taught me that this is a big, robust, organized business, and not nearly as random as I believed. And after years of patiently listening to technicians, as well as die, overemphasize security and the dangers of the internet. Being a part of this process has taught me that if anything, 
this vulnerability is being undersold. And perhaps the most important lesson of all is the one that Claremont pointed out earlier, the difference between HIPAA secure and HIPAA compliant. Just like my users, for three decades, I've really believed that if I did my job well enough, I could protect them from the bad guys and even from themselves. I've always reminded them that the key to network security isn't in the server room, it's between the chair and the keyboard. But inside, I really believed that I could prevent something bad from happening to them. But it took about 1% of our users clicking the link in a phishing email to open the gates of our network wide to threat actors. Because secure means I'm doing my job, but compliant means they're doing theirs. These are the common suggestions we found everywhere we looked. And as I examined them, I realized the one thing they had in common is that not one of them would have prevented what happened to us. If we'd had more resilient backups, we could have recovered better. But even that wouldn't have kept it from happening in the first place. So I've taken away a few simple lessons from my experience with this incident. One of them is that your network is a lot like your car or your house. If you take reasonable precautions, you know, like securing insurance for your car or house, locked doors, you can certainly reduce the possibility of burglary or car theft. But nothing you do will make you 100% safe from it. So you need to take all the reasonable precautions and most importantly, prepare for what you will do when they fail. No one goes into a car with the intention of getting into an accident. But you need to be prepared and know what steps to take if you do. You've probably figured out most of these on your own as we've been talking, but there is one element we haven't mentioned. No matter what your staff's professions are, they probably work with technology, and a lot of them know exactly what they need to know to do their jobs and nothing more. They get their jobs done well and stumble around their computers, sometimes causing their own problems and then complaining about how the computer is acting up again. And we chuckle and we fix it, and now and again, we might even make an attempt to show them how to not do that to themselves again. But ultimately, for them, the computer is a strange and mysterious box that does weird things. And because that's true, they have no way to tell the difference between a weird thing that they accidentally caused to happen and a weird thing that they should be telling a tech about immediately. The single biggest vulnerability in your network security, from my perspective, is your workforce. The single best investment you can make in network security is to treat tech skills as job skills and ensure your staff are knowledgeable enough to recognize when something isn't right and understand the importance of not waiting to call it out. Your best available defense against these kinds of cyber threats isn't the server room. It's the staff who know better than to click the link, who recognize when their computer is behaving funny, who understand the importance of adhering to your tech policies and the potential costs of not doing so. Like every other area of calculated and measured risk in your organization, the best, most effective risk mitigation is highly trained staff who are reducing that risk for you. Unlike most risk calculations, the risk factor doesn't change based on what percentage of your staff achieve competency because it only takes one person to click that link. One of our biggest frustrations was the lack of information about what to expect from this process. When companies get hit, everything goes dark. The information stops flowing and it never starts again. We understand that commercial corporations have profit, stockholder, and reputation considerations, but as a public entity, we felt like we were in a position to offer a little more transparency and that the best service we could provide to our constituents was to share information so that they'd be better prepared than we were. We're sure you'll understand that there are legal and network security considerations around some of this information, so there are some questions we're just not going to answer. But within those boundaries, 
we'll do our best to try to demystify the process a little. At the top of that list, the first question that people tend to ask us is how much did you pay? The answer is that we paid the amount of our insurance deductible. We mentioned earlier that we got lucky with a fairly low ransom compared to other similar entities. Uh, but that ransom was the smallest part of the cost of this event. Because we're a non-for-profit business, we didn't suffer loss of profits either. And though it took time, we recovered our da data with no material loss. But the cost of legal, forensic, notification, resources rose well into the seven figures. I'm going to repeat, we had the simplest, least complicated, least expensive, and most successful result possible at a cost of six months of productivity impact and well over a million dollars. And that cost is having an impact on all of us. As ransomware has surged during the pandemic, insurers have become leery of the market. Cybersecurity policy options demand more and offer less. With lower coverage and more specific security requirements in place in order to qualify. So with that in mind, it doesn't matter what the numbers are. It's far more important to understand that even a simple incident like ours may not be fully covered a year from now. When you get hit, your insurer may not be ready to support you or nearly as supportive as ours uh, have been. So it's important for all of us to understand how to take care of ourselves when these things occur. So what would you like to talk about? 